Hey there, book team. Noah, everyone who reads and must converse is the channel. I'm joined by the uh, the awesome Ami, 1649, right? That's right. Thank you for coming by, brother. Thank you for coming along. And uh, thank you so much for hooking me up with a uh, little Christmas action. Don't mention it. <laughs> One of the most awesome... That I haven't, you know, I didn't know before. Nice. So um, I've had a lot of fun going through this. First off, I just want to say that this is a buddy read for me with To the Lit House. Yasmin has been going through these stories with me. And we are like uniquely fitted for the study of, of Borges' fiction because I love the esoteric. I love um, Jewish mysticism, Kabbalah, things that Borges brings up, esoteric stuff. And he is Argentinian just as Yasmin is, so she can bring that cultural, historical kind of stuff to bear on these stories, and, and we're just having a... Yeah. When was your first... Uh, <laughs> when did you first come in contact with Borges? I was in college. I took a course on Borges, and then with the same great, great teacher, I took a course on uh, South American literature. Um, so that, that was sort of like a broader part of that landscape and then um since then i was hooked you know so i just just consumed as much pork as i could nice yeah it definitely is amazing let me tell you all right so tonight we're going to get into the secret miracle this is a story that's in fictions it's in the second part of fictions um first part of fictions is called the garden of forking path paths the second part is artifices and this is right in the middle of uh, fifth story out of uh, nine. So right in the middle of artifices is the secret miracle. I saw this story as super cinematic. Mm, okay. You know, did you, did you get those kind of vibes that it was just like a, it was a scene and uh, you know, I, I got feelings of like Brazil by Terry Gilliam. If you've ever seen that, just this weird mix of fantasy and reality um imagination and the 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 quotidian you know day to day um, yeah I, I hear you i hear you for sure uh so, it's, yeah. it's it's like a, there's like a timeline right we start with dates you know um you, i think you froze there for a second but um we, there's, there's like there's like this inexorable process of time that's sort of like crunching the story propelling it forward right so uh yeah we're in uh <laughs> we're in prague czech mm -hmm. republic that's right and we got a a, a main character yaramir Haladek. he is um a, an artist a writer he has an unfinished tragedy called the enemies he uh did a study on jacob bohm jacob bohm however you want to pronounce it mm -hmm. um he wrote a book called Vindication of Eternity. And I think that that title is something that Borges chose very deliberately yep. for this. The Vindication of Eternity, right? Mm -hmm. And he did a translation of their Sefer Yetzira. And their Sefer Yetzira is the oldest extant uh, book of Jewish mysticism that we have. It's pretty much um, numerology, Germantria. Mm -hmm. It's completely impenetrable to anyone who's not <laughs> not on the inner circle of you know like the oral tradition of jewish mysticism or something like that it's it you know you read that if you read the separate zero you don't have any idea what it's talking about um i have a book this this thick here the fundamentals of jewish mysticism this is only exploring the separate zero which is mm -hmm. a very very small work 20 pages or something Mm -hmm. But and this doesn't still doesn't uh, really get you there. You got to do a lot of intuitive leaps to get there. Mm -hmm. So this guy is that kind of um, author. But you can see all of his um, all of his writings are Jewish or Jewish sympathizing. Um, the book starts it with a dream. That's right. The first dream. Two it's an families, amazing dream. Yeah, it's an amazing dream. And uh, have you read the uh, poem Borges uh, wrote called Chess? 
Oh, I don't remember it. I don't remember it. So now I can't think it, of it. it. It reminded me, and we and we kind of touched on that when we uh, read this, me and Yasmin, or Yasmin and I. Mm -hmm. And so uh, <laughs> two families play an eternal game of chess. He's the oldest uh, son of one of these families that are in this chess game. A bell rings or, or the call to play chess goes, and he finds himself running across the desert in the rain. So uh, opposites, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he forgets completely how to play chess, how the pieces move or what the pieces are, and then he wakes up. Yeah. So kind of a nightmare. <laughs> And, and it parallels what's happening in his historical moment in a way. I mean, ve like vaguely. I mean, it's a nightmare of a dream, but he's about to awake to a nightmare of reality. That's right. And where um, chess is like the miniature war, mm -hmm. it's a battlefield. And he is in the Czech Republic in Prague as the Third Reich is rolling in and taking over that uh, part of Europe. So he... Um, is arrested by Nazis very quickly and uh, sentenced to death for Jewish sympathies. Um, his mother was Jewish, which makes him Jewish. And he's written a translation of the Sefer Yetzira. Um, he, he is, uh, by all accounts, um, you know, guilty to, 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 of being Jewish. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, so, so they put him in a, in a cell and he's just there in there. He fears and imagines his death endlessly. And I love this part. Borges mm -hmm. is master. Um, he fears and uh, imagines his death endlessly. And it is a thing where he gets to a point where it says what, that what you can imagine. Right will never really happen right ever. it's never going to be played exactly the way he imagines it he figures <laughs> <laughs> it's great it says something to the effect that he becomes where he starts doing some uh weird kind of magic right with it where he's uh what does it say trusting in that frail magic mm. he begins to invent horrible deaths right. so that they would not occur <laughs> right right so he's and, becoming kind of obsessed about that the fact that he's going to die in 10 days, right? Right. They gave him they gave him 10 days and I love the the reason why. The date was set set for March 29th, 10 days away from where mm -hmm. uh, from the date and that delay whose importance the reader will soon discover was caused by the administrative desire to work impersonally and deliberately as vegetables do. Or planets. I love that. It's amazing, right? It's so the experience of just being victimized by inhuman processes that just, you know, just do, just march forward, um, and also just in the same in the same area. Like Borges describes that process of imagining all the deaths as Hellatic died hundreds of deaths. You know, it's like because because there's always seems to be this like tension between, you know, the, the internal world of our protagonist and you know the physical world and and um, it's a kind of it, it, the, all the ways he's grappling with this. And then you also have the fact that he, he concludes that he's immortal until right. the day of his execution. You know, nothing, right. nothing the, can happen. For those to, 10 days, for those right. 10 days, I am immortal. Right. Like, what is that? Well, that's a, a paradox. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's completely great. So um, the, 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 the story is just a killer when it comes down to it. Um, there's so much beautiful imagery and these kind of things that show up. Um, and I was reminded of another story. Actually, uh, Yasmin brought this up in our discussion of Funes. Mm, his memories, yep. Yeah, his memory, yep. Both, totally. of these, both of those characters live in an eternal world, uh, in internal, uh, e eternal kind of world. But the difference is, is that Funes is actual. He's he sees every part of the actual world and he's actually like devoid of imagining. He can't imagine anything. But this uh, our guy, Halidic, is all imagination. He is all imagination. That's all it is. And it says there um, there is there's that there's another quote that. He admired 
verse in drama because it does not allow spectators to forget unreality. Mm. And that unreality is a condition of art. Right, right, right. And that speaks to like the postmodern uh, aesthetic in a way, or this, this idea of like art, which is aware of its own constructedness. Um, mm. Because it's not, it's not trying to like fool you in, in a sense. It's like, it's, it's, it's trying to be transparent to the sense in which you're consuming something constructed. Right. Um, and it is, it is purely, uh, it, it's, it's only um, concerned with creating something, creating mm -hmm. something new. And to create something new is to, is, is in, in the way Borges is putting it here, unreality, not, not pulling from, you know, and just this, this realism kind of thing of just describing everything as it is. And that, be, I mean, it's a beautiful way of doing a story or prose, but mm -hmm. that art is creating something out of reality. Out of out of the constituents that you have to work with, whether that even be just pure imagination, which I see is uh, our boy, <laughs> our boy yeah. here. He's 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 just like you know pure imagination. So yeah. um, <laughs> it's a, it's killer. Um, the night before his his death, um, you know these these nine days they fly by, of course, because he's just love. He, you know he's he's in his revelry kind of. He's immortal. And he's and he's and he's fine, but that that last night comes all too quickly, and and that kind of thing we can kind of see that that would happen. You know, you would that that day is going to come really fast. You know, I mean, yeah. ten days, ten days, uh, your last ten days, uh, you're going to be at that final day before you know it. And he uh, starts going over in his mind before uh, as as night falls his unfinished play. And we get a whole uh, page, maybe page and a half, that is actually his play and what his play is about. Um, you got anything to say about that? Because he does it all mentally. Right. Well, it's it's a wild play, right? So I don't remember the character's name, uh, but let's see if I pull it up. So the play, right, so, so the play observed the unities of time, place, and action. It took place in some library in Rammerstadt, in the library of Baron Rammerstadt. Okay, and so there's a stranger, so this is like this Baron, this Baron Rammerstadt, this guy, and he's getting visitors at seven o'clock at night, the clock struck seven, and he's getting visitors in his library. And he's, over time, the audience becomes aware that people are plotting against him. And then this character becomes aware that people are plotting against him. There's all this intrigue. And the night is sort of starting to unravel and he ends up um, like killing someone, and right. uh, and then as as the play goes on and on, it becomes more and more unhinged and absurd, and, and dead characters start coming back into the play, and and we learn about through the dialogue that there's this person who I think uh, had an affair with his wife, who thinks now that he's the Baron, um, who's like lost his mind, and and as the play unravels, and as like the cl the, the clock strikes seven again, so like that no time has passed from the beginning of the play. Um, we sort of come to the conclusion that this guy who we thought was the Baron is actually a crazy person who's living in his own mind. And he is that guy. <laughs> right. He's the that guy who right, kind exactly. of thinks he is the who Baron. we thought the main character is the whole time. Right. Exactly. That's a Borgesian play. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> it's, totally. It's great. But it's unfinished. He has the first act and he has a scene or two in the, in the last act finished. And he prays to God. Um, he prays to God. And on his last night, he says, if I do somehow exist, if I am not one of thy repetitions or errata, then I exist as the author of the enemies. That's his play. In order to complete that play, which can justify me and justify you as well, God, I need one more year. Grant me those days, thou who art the centuries and time itself. Right. And, and that's so, such an important quote yeah. to me. But yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, that's that's I'd, I'd love to hear it first before I get. Yeah, because because this whole book, this whole story and so much about Borges writes also is, is premised on this idea that there's like an infinite significance to the act of, of creating a work of literature. There's the sense that like it's it's like infinitely important that he concludes the story and it's about like justifying 
his life and it's about justifying right. existence in general. Right. Um, yeah, I, 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 and as in the next scene, when when God responds, it's it's through text, it's through books as well. There's there's a sense in which we're you know God imagines us, and 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 we imagine our own creation. You know, there's like a, there's something like creative about um, the, the act of writing. You know, in a divine way. Right. Uh, just creating. Uh, you know, I, th I think it can be even broadened like that. So just creating something uh, with Borges, it's writing um, in a lot of Borges' stories. It's writing because that's what the way that Borges is creating. But it's he's he's not exclusive to writing as far as uh, justification. It's creates being creative. And um, I think that that the prayer is where I called out uh, that like. There is something there from the separate yet zero um, that Borges does have uh, some kind of um, experience with. And this is from chapter one, Mishnah seven of the separate yet zero. The ten sephirot, which are of nothing, insert their end in their beginning and their beginning in their end, like a flame bound to a coal that a single master who has no second and before one what do you count? Mm. So before one, what do you count? Uh, nothing, because God is one, right? Uh, this is Jewish uh, mysticism and, uh, you know, hero Israel, the Lord thy God, the Lord is one. And so in that is uh, ends run true to origins and uh, time is, 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 you know, all, all one, the threshold, right? The man on the threshold. <laughs> I don't understand. You lost me there. Uh, the the story, uh, the Borges story, the man on the threshold. Oh yeah, gotcha, gotcha. The, gotcha, the nice, old nice. guy. <laughs> yeah, the yeah, old yeah. guy where it seems like you know time is nothing for him. I, I see that one as like mm. he's like an archetypal. Nice. Father yeah. time maybe. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Nice. Um. So. Uh, he prays, and he falls fast asleep on his last night alive, which you know, called out earlier in the story would be, of course, a sleepless night. Mm -hmm. You'd wake up, you know, having not slept and be, you know, why you lose the last eight hours of your life sleeping, mm -hmm. you know, and, but, but he falls fast asleep and he has the next dream, the second dream. Uh, he dreamed that he was in hiding one of the, in, in one of the naves of the Clementine library. What are you looking for? A librarian wearing dark glasses asked him. I'm looking for God, Halidic replied. God, the librarian said, is one of the letters on one of the pages on one of 400,000 volumes in the Clementine. My parents and my parents' parents searched for that letter. I myself have gone blind searching for it. And he removed his spec spectacles and Halidic saw his eyes, which are now dead. A reader came to return an atlas. This atlas is worthless, he said, and handed it to Halliday. This is his dream now. He opened it at random. He saw a map of India, a dizzying page. Suddenly certain he touched one of the tiny letters and a voice that was everywhere spoke to him. The time for your labor has been granted and Halliday awoke. So seeming by uh, random, this guy uh, bringing back an atlas, right? But nothing is random. There is no such thing as random. There's no such thing as chance. Not, not really. Uh, if, if, if conditions and causes are the exact same, then the same result is going to come out of it. Mm -hmm. um, variables that are too small for our minds to process or too complex for our minds to process give rise to our idea of what chance and randomness is but it seems like and and Borges uses it to great effect that there is just that kind of randomness in finding the letter of God but the second he touches it um he hears the uh, uh, the voice telling him that his time will be granted his prayer was for a year right yeah and uh that next part, uh, he just, I, I, I wanted to go on there exactly, actually, because the next little, the next little, um, 
Yeah. He remembered that the dreams of men belong to God and that my amenities had written that the words of a dream when they are clear and distinct and one cannot see who spoke them are holy. And that is uh, Moses, my amenities, the author to, of the guide to the for the perplexed. And what he's referring to there is book two and uh, chapter 41 where uh, he says, it's crazy how well-read Borges is. Yeah, he reads everything <laughs> for sure. <laughs> no doubt. And, and well-read on esotericism. I love oh, yeah. it. Um, but uh, my amenity says there are four different ways in which scripture relates the fact that a divine communication was made to a prophet. One, the prophet relates that he heard the words of an angel in a dream or a vision. Two, he reports the words of an angel without mentioning that they were perceived in a dream or a vision, assuming that it is well known that prophecy can only originate in one of the two ways. Uh, numbers, chapter 12, verse 6. In a vision, I will make myself known unto him. In a dream, I will speak unto him. Those are uh, words attributed to God in the book of Numbers. The prophet, the prophet doesn't mention the angel at all. He says that God spoke to him, but he states that he received the message in a dream or vision. Uh, that's number three. And then number four, he introduces his prophecy by stating that God spoke to him or told him to do a certain thing or speak certain words, but he does not explain that he received the message in a dream or vision because he assumes that it is well known and that it's been established as a principle that no prophecy or revelation originates otherwise than in a dream or a vision and through an angel. So, um, in a waking dream, in a waking vision, or in a dream, is the only way that God uh, speaks to the mind of men. That's what my amenities is saying, mm -hmm. and and Borges is bringing that to bear just on that uh, part right there. Yeah, so that, that now it gets interesting. So his wish is granted. <laughs> he's it's granted, and he is a he's awoke he awakes and he's led swiftly up to the firing, to the firing squad, squad. He's, he's set to die at 9 a.m right so we're sitting at uh, 9 a.m and uh the secret miracle commences right he uh is brought he waits a minute and then he sat he stood in front of the firing squad they tell him to step forward a couple of paces because they don't want blood splattering on the wall kind of gruesome and then a a raindrop falls on his forehead and starts going down his cheek and time completely comes to a stop as uh, the sergeant gives the final call to fire and yeah. he is completely bewildered as as you would be right yeah so he's sort of frozen right but right. he has subjective time the, the subjective time is passing in his mind and he's able to work out the rest of his of his of his of his play paralyzed it says right exactly and he's thinking through well he's thinking through that first he's like well everybody's right. paralyzed the the shadow of the bee isn't moving over there on that rock right the drop is still on my cheek what is going on here and it says he slept mm -hmm. and he awoke mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. everything was the same right and by like a day and a half maybe uh two days later he realizes what has happened that the voice in the dream was actually uh, God speaking to him to grant his wish of having a year to complete his uh, his play, right? And 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 I just want to really explore that here until the end. Then, so his play is justification for himself, his own life, and justification for God as a created being by God. Him creating and doing and, and doing his art is right. justifying God, but it is completely internal and imagining, and nobody will ever know it but him and God. And right. it is completely secret and secret having the esoteric meaning of secret. Secret is a secret because it's incommunicable. Yeah. It doesn't matter what you say or how you could say it, you can't communicate this to another person. That's that's a secret. Right. 
And additionally, this particular play that he's writing to me seems to like be getting at something very, very fundamental. It, it seems like Haladic is like trying to work through the ultimate nature of reality. He's trying to encode in this play, which like, as you said, is in the most ephemeral and you know temporary medium, just the medium of a mind that's about to be extinguished. Um, he's he's working through like what is what is life and what is identity you know we think we're we're people we think we're the baron of of of, of some place um but but it's but it's much more but 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 our perceptions of identity are 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 mistaken and and they're illus illusory and our reality is constructed you know we we construct we construct our world you know and i feel like that's that's sort of what he's getting at right right we construct our world uh, in in our minds. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and so, go ahead. Sorry. You got more. <laughs> I was just gonna say more. the centrality of dreams. You know, the dreams play such an important role in the story because because mm -hmm. there's a parallel between the dream and the reality. They're both constructions. You know, as far as Borges is concerned, um, to to live to, to to live into dream are are synonymous in every sense. They're both they're both experiences of the mind right yeah it's a it's an awesome thing and borges is a master at at, at exploring that kind of thing uh, from all different directions in his stories and bring you know you have very compelling narratives that take you to a really wild place and and you're and you're exploring that kind of idea mm -hmm. so um one thing that we got into really harsh really hardcore and it started with your uh, video on the circular ruins. There's some parallels to that in this. And um, I was left after reading the circular ruins the first time and watching your video the se for a second time after I read it, thinking, why, why, how, how does creation of this simulacrum justify this man what it, what is it that justifies him and then that at the end this guy is also a simulacrum of in a, in a way um maybe of god maybe of a previous man and this is a nested kind of keep on a infinite set kind of thing right so if it's like that how does it justify his being, because obviously, you know, there is something there and I wasn't able to get it. But through reading so much Borges now, I think I've gotten somewhere with it. So creativity justifies being, be justifies a lie. That is uh, what he kind of is postulating. And um, I take it to be like life equals art all kinds of art, any kind of art, any kind of creativity. And if your life is equal to art, Blake said it wonderful. I got uh, William Blake's uh, picture. Paradise of, Lost. Uh, Paradise Lost. Yeah, Miller's yeah. Paradise Lost there. Not, yeah. for that, not for that specific thing, but we'll get into one more little quote there in a second just to bear this out. But J Blake said all of the apostles were artists. Jesus was an artist. These, these to, to be a spiritual being is to be an artist, to mm -hmm. be a creative, because creation is what it's about. Try. It comes down to free will. We have a choice. You make the choice and to live uh, by faith, uh, take that leap of faith, take that intuitive leap. Circumstances don't matter. That's what's borne out in this story very well, that the circumstances in which you do it don't even matter. It could be just in your mind, in that infinite present moment that nobody else is ever going to see anything of, just between you and God. Fame, fame, acknowledgement uh, don't matter. That it's imagined doesn't matter. But do it. Have the choice. Having free will to make mistakes, which is ultimately destructive. All mistakes are destructive. <laughs> Having free will to make mistakes is what gives the choice to create the weight that it has. Because we can choose to make mistakes and we can choose to 
do do whatever you know but to to come to the conclusion that you devote yourself to something virtuous in the way of creating art that um is that has the weight that it has because of the fact that we have free will mm -hmm. i'm reminded and why i brought this out is the book nine of paradise lost where J where satan says save for destruction all joy is lost for me mm -hmm. and that's the adversary speaking that uh destruction is the only joy left for him and we're called to create to to make something do you think that that's uh <laughs> what do you think about that yeah in life? I no, I, I love it. I think I think it's it's beautiful, and I think it's very uh, attuned to like what Borges is doing um, in this story and in general, where where he seeks out the divine in creativity and and specifically, most frequently in books. I think um, like infinite libraries, like the Library of Babel, for example, or the Library of of his dream in, in this particular story, and you know, like in in um. In, in, in Jewish mysticism, which I'm not very familiar with at all, um, maybe I've like absorbed you know small amounts through like vague exposure. But in Jewish mysticism, the, this this concept of the power of the word, the word is this creative force, um, and I think Borges uh, really resonated that. I think he saw uh, like a literary creation almost in the world that he inhabited, um, and I think it explains to some extent his very vague and amorphous you know notion of God because because he's a very mystical person and God does make some random appearances but it's not very present because because God is like the author you know I think in, in, right. in, in Borges's conception the um, divine artist exactly the, public, the divine uh you know <laughs> yeah yeah and and there's just one last point I wanted to just to just just say about the story I, I think we did an awesome job of sort of like hitting upon like you know all sorts of deep thought stuff but this poem hits really hard for me like really really hard on almost every single paragraph. And the reason why for me is because I feel like we're all this protagonist. We all have an execution date and we're all in that cell, you know, imagining our deaths, you know, and dying a hundred deaths of, you know, anxieties about our future and about, because because we all know we're gonna die. And, and, and want to, something to give our lives meaning. Exactly. And it's about mm -hmm. how do we justify our lives? You know, right. how do you, yeah, how do you find meaning in a, in a limited time span that we're given, you know? It, it, it is. It, it's, it's, a, it's an amazing thing. I'll touch on one thing that you said before, that uh, the word is definitely uh, something that is, is, is being, uh, is, is kind of a nexus for Borges, and that, that uh, Greek is logos. Mm -hmm. And logos actually has the meaning um, one of the many, you know, few meanings that it has is the word meaning. Mm. Logos is purpose. Logos is meaning. So in that is uh, is meaning in in speaking into what it is that you really feel, really are, really you know, mm -hmm. embody. I think that um, I can't really <laughs> I can't really speak to what gives anybody else meaning other than myself and uh to me uh that kind of thing is connections and it is um you know the 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 back and forth in which inspiration happens i'm inspired by people and i feel fulfilled and i feel you know expanded and when I and when I'm doing that, and other people are inspired by something that I say, they feel that expansive uh, quality, and that is making us bigger and bigger, and making us more full, and we are getting closer and closer to, you know, out of ourselves and part of the whole, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. rather yeah. than you know in our own little on our own little islands, right? So inspiration, I think, is what is a, is a big key to uh, where meaning 
lies, being inspired, living an inspired life. And Borges definitely has a lot of fun with his stories. And he, you can see him behind the words kind of chuckling at the reader <laughs> when, you're, when you're reading things. He was having a blast. And it's just beautiful, so yeah. beautiful to uh, experience what he could do. And he knew what he was doing. He was such a genius. So unique, you know, so unique. Um, and like what other, I can't think of any other, again, I, I've, I've read a, a, a pretty nice variety of South American literature, but you know, even in, in his same milieu, even in anything I've read, you know, writers who bring in mathematics as a major theme, who, who are obsessed with infinities in the way he's they just he's he's so unique because like the word Borgesian enter, enters the lexicon because he's like really has no peer in in stylistically speaking you know right I mean he really doesn't have any I was I was saying uh you know you hear people say like well you know he's he's a he's like like Borges like Borges or Borgesian as referring to another author I don't no. see it <laughs> right I don't see it let me yeah. tell you. I mean, the the closest that I've ever come in contact with of somebody like Borges is Calvino, mm, and nice. Calvino yeah, sure. is not like Borges. Yeah, <laughs> I hear that. I hear you that. know, it's his own, uh, and Borges is, I would say, Borges is a magnitude stronger mm -hmm. because I mean, maybe several orders of magnitude stronger because Borges does what he does so succinctly and with so much power. It's ridiculous. Yeah. The word. The word, the, the use of words is is distilled down to its essence. Everything is you're getting the essence of it. And you might think that you're in a narrative most of the time. And the narrative elements are very intriguing and it's on. But then you're thrust into something that's just otherworldly. Super, yeah. super, super uh natural, but not supernatural in old. Yeah. You know, you know, ultra natural, right? <laughs> like something transcendental. That's mm -hmm. what it is. Yeah. Something transcendental. Transcendental writing is uh is how I see it. Thank you very much for coming on, Ami. Thank we'll you, do Noah. Four, four exploration. I, awesome. I, I I read the Aleph today. Nice. My mind has been blown all day. <laughs> it's one of his most famous. <laughs> oh, it's ridiculous. Yeah, we finished the Aleph this morning. So um, it's on. We'll just All do right. some more. We're going to do some more fictions. I think uh, Yasmin is getting on with me tomorrow, and we're going to go through the short story, The End. Amazing. Nice. Yeah. Can't wait to yeah. watch that. The, the End. It's two stories after this one in fictions. Nice. So, yeah, we'll do it tomorrow night. I think we're doing it tomorrow night at 9, if I'm not mistaken. But I'll put a card up. You guys will see it. Sweet. Thank you very much, Ami. Noah, thank you. Catch you on the next one, brother. See you later.